Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, spending lunch time with uh, us, humble <laughs> CISOs. Uh, so we changed the analyst VC panel from the printed sheet to a CISO panel. Thought it would be more interesting to, for all of you to hear from how chief security information officers, uh, chief information security officers of different companies uh, think about service mesh and the, the, the interaction between DevOps, IT, and service mesh. So my name is Deepak Jeevan Kumar. I'll be the moderator for the panel today. Uh, I'm currently a uh, managing director at Dell Technologies Capital, a venture capital firm, um, and uh, a humble investor in TradeTrade as well. So uh, let's uh, start by, so we'll have about 30 minutes for the panel and we'll have a break again before the session starts again at 1.30. And we will have a few, few minutes towards the end of the panel for questions from the audience. So let me um, ask everybody to introduce themselves just to start with. Ori, do you want to go first? So uh, we're talking about introductions? Yep, quick, okay. quick intros, yeah. <coughs> quick intros. So I'm Ori Lupescu. I look after security and compliance at Ernest, uh, FinTech, looking for, uh, basically pro uh, providing consumer finance. Richard Cyerson, I'm the CEO of Soluble and Recovering CISO. Uh, so, Ori and uh, Rich, could you also talk about your CISO gigs right before this as well? All right, so m essentially 20 some odd years experience. Uh, previous to my, in my previous role, I was looking after security and compliance for a biotech. Uh, previous life, I was in financial services, Wall Street, uh, AIG, JP Morgan Chase. Spent some time at Schwab, so been around the block a couple of times. Spent some time in advisory services, so um, yeah, a long time. Sure. So again, CEO Soluble, previously CISO Lending Club, CISO Twilio, CISO G Healthcare, etc., etc., etc. Author and meme wrangler, and uh, judge for the RSA Innovation Sandbox startup competition. Yes, I judge the RSA Innovation Sandbox. Sandeep Hoonan, um, res responsible for cloud security at VMware. Um, before that, I was uh, at PwC and had a um, lot of SAP security and enterprise security um, responsibilities. Uh, Tom Baltus, Delta Dental Insurance Company. Um, we're the country's largest dental benefits carrier. If you've been to see your dentist sometime in the last 50 years, chances are you may have encountered our brand. Um, CISO uh, of um, Blue Cross Blue Shield organization, several different ones prior to that, as well as a couple of CISO gigs at uh, property and casualty uh, insurance uh, industry before that. Firstly, thank you all for uh, taking time. And uh, service mesh is an uh, exciting area. There is a lot of hype, and today we heard from some of the creators of different projects of service meshes here on Envoy. So uh, I think the, fir the first question is, um, when did you all hear about Service Mesh, the Istio and Envoy projects, and what context, and what was your first reaction when you heard about these projects? Who wants to go first? Sorry? I'll go first. So it was actually before V1, and it was last year, about a year and a little more than a year ago, where developers, our development team, uh, came and said, look, we're, um, we're having a, an aggravating experience with this uh, microservice authentication uh, that was implemented, so everyone had to build it in every microservice. And they said, look, there's something out there that's pretty cool. Why don't we look at it? So we kind of looked at it, and he said, wow, that's definitely interesting. And he promptly went in the backlog and eventually resurfaced. But that was the first time developers actually came and brought it to, uh, to our attention. Sure. Um, most recently at Lending Club, we started looking at uh, Istio. We were doing a lot with Kubes, and we were just starting to kick the tires. Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate to work for VMware, so we're obviously thinking a lot about cloud. We've got a lot of innovation there. We have some folks, Pear and others, um, who are obviously building the NSX service mesh, um, and then obviously um, had the privilege of kind of meeting the Tetrate folks as well a while back. Yeah, so for us, for us I think the sort of, you know, coming into the realization that this is an interesting um, uh, possible technology solution uh, came from an effort that started a while ago in the enterprise, uh, which is essentially uh, focused on transforming and transitioning us into what we call a composable enterprise. And that term is, if you've heard it used by some vendors, a little bit different than uh, how most people define it. 
in that we really see the future uh, uh, model of our IT environment in the way where our own organization is nothing more than a, uh, a single provider of SaaS services to our employees and contractors and other constituents among many, many, many other uh, SaaS providers as well. And so that type of vision, um, you know, not to expand too much on it, leads us down a path of uh, identifying some very unique and interesting challenges for which we've been looking for solutions for some time before uh, Istio, before uh, Service Mesh as a general concept, even became sort of recognizable and, and, uh, uh, and addressable. And so happy to reflect on some of these challenges in the subsequent uh, uh, conversation here and also give you a sense for you know, how perhaps Istio might, might be a solution or at least we hope might be a solution to them. So I'm going to um, like ask three or four questions. They're all interrelated. And so feel free to slice and dice it how you want. So um, in your organization, how should a service mesh adoption journey look like? When does the security team get involved? When is the CISO team involved? Uh, and does service mesh actually complicate or simplify security and identity problems for you? And the final question is, do you really have a choice about service mesh? Do you have to adopt it? There's no choice. Or can you fight it? <laughs> you can start with the final question. Can you fight I, I service can, mesh? I can <laughs> jump in. Um, so you know, what do we do? What do we security folks do? So in an organ for those of you who don't know, we, um, we're really accountable, right? We're accountable. When, when things go, how do you know that these are accountable? They get fired, right? That's, by the way, that's how you know you're accountable for something. Um, so that's a good uh, Boolean test there. So, but we're, we are accountable for the implementation of the stuff, of the things, right? And then uh, operations, DevOps, what have you, is responsible for execution. So our job is to be able to define what it means to be I secure. And I think that what um, Istio does in, in general, right, um, it really makes it easy to do a lot of things that we want to do in the first place in terms of being able to govern the infrastructure really easy, you know, with um, sidecar capability, be able to have great visibility, um, you know, in terms of uh, SSL termination or being able to say, well, do, you know, do TLS this way. I mean, just the dynamic nature of that makes it a lot easier. But, but just because it's easy doesn't reduce our accountability. I think that's an important distinction. Um, in fact, because it's easy, it's easier to spin up a lot of stuff in a lot of our regions. It's easier to expose more value to more people through more channels at higher velocity. So while you've reduced the complexity of the stack, you've made it much easier to, produce, to expose more. And with that, so with, with that, you're exposing a lot more uh, value, hopefully, to your, to your customers. But from, a, from an accountable perspective, that's creating a lot more risk, or risk surface would probably be the right term. So uh, long story short, uh, we need to be very involved in that. We need to be very involved in the design process, but we need to be able, be able to be involved in a way that's ideally frictionless in terms of spinning things up and getting things out. Hmm. That's a lot of words. So can I ask an add-on question, which can be part of this whole uh, set, uh, this group of questions. Who pays for it? Is the budget coming from the CISO? Or it comes from the CIO, VP of DevOps? Because there's some security aspects of service mesh as well, quite a few. If you're going to hear later in the day about the next generation access control and service mesh. So, how, how does that work? I, I'll just pile on, and then you guys can can run with it. Um, if whoever's responsible for uh, again responsible for execution, DevOps or Dev operations, um, typically if I have the budget, I'm effectively going to be transferring. I'll govern its execution of that budget, um, but I'll be transferring that to them because they're going to be doing the proof of concept. They're going to be the ones who are going to be turning the wrenches, right? Um, so that's how I've always operated. If I were to go advocate for the budget because I have an outcome that I need, I can then transfer that budget to the people who are going to actually be responsible for execution. And that's exactly how I operated it at Lending Club. So he here's my two cents. Um, I think it depends who's interested in it in the first place. Now, you're not going to play necessarily for the mm -hmm. technology. The, the technology is open source. But you eventually may want to have a product that's supported. And I think with this, especially in the security space, we're, and this is, I don't know how many of you have looked at it. There is a flurry of companies that have started up expanding what Istio does and the, this uh, whole concept to micro-segmentation, but not only to microservices but they extend it to the entire stack, the entire platform. So you can have EC2, the same functionality, the same governance, you can now extend it to uh, EC2 instances. 
So all of a sudden, you can have a central policy across the organization. There's companies like Octarine, uh, Banyan Ops, and others that are sprouting almost every other day. They take this to the next level. So that becomes a security solution. So I'll be paying for that. So it's interesting that now it started from a development team, but I'm actually championing this and saying I'll pay for it because I want sort of this zero trust. Uh, I want to, have a, uh, to, to basically have the ability to introduce some level of control in the environment. So yeah, I think it depends who's championing the idea that ultimately is who's paying for it and the involvement of the security folks will vary if, you know, if they're kind of brought in at some point or if they're driving it. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I look at it, a couple of thoughts is um, the role I play is to enable the business. So at the end of the day, the business is generating the revenue and I'm trying to be the, in a position to help them generate the most revenue. One of the things that will not help them generate revenue is if we don't pr produce and we don't create secure products. Right? So I think I try to resolve the paying question by, both, by looking at it from a business standpoint and saying how uh, what you're doing in delivering your products not, is, is actually not hurting you in the long run, long run because you're not delivering it in a secure manner. So for example, I mean, I think the way I look at it in our landscape is, okay, you've got a bunch of containers that are out there. How are we providing good security from it? That's a little bit more of a tactical problem. But if I even kind of go up a little bit further than that, um, in this whole context of containers and things like that, at the end of the day, I've got a bunch of services that are talking to one another. How am I going to mediate those services and these API calls and all of that? That's, there's a lot of security that's related to that. How are my credentials going to be? Are they going to expire? Are they going to be rotated frequently enough? Are they going to live out there in the wild? Things like that. Now that's again a bigger, broader problem that adds a lot of risk to it. And even, even more broader than that is how is my data? Where is my data? How is my data being used, exchanged among services? And of course, I mean, you know, besides the security concerns of that, there's the obvious compliance implications of that, GDPR and other things and all of that. So no matter where I'm skinning that cat, so to speak, whether we're talking about actually just managing containers in a very technical way or broadening it out to a compliance requirement and managing our data holistically, um, my job is to try to explain to the BUs, the business owners, look, here overall from an enterprise, here's the problems that we need to solve. Um, at the end of the day, it's coming out of somebody's pocket, left or right, CEO or somebody out there, right? So I think, look, I mean, I, I try to present it that way and say, look, together we have to go. We have to build that culture of adoption together, saying this problem needs to be solved. There's the compliance problems, there's the overall data problems, and then now we can tactically solve it through a container issue or a specific way in trying to solve it. Um, but the underlying issue is that I think that what I've really loved about a service mesh is that they're solving problems that microservices are creating. There is so much that's out there, so whatever service mesh uh, challenges there are. I know it's kind of relatively new and there are pain points, but they're solving a lot more problems than I have right now with all of my microservices just being out there, the redundancy and the lack of good security that's out there. So basically you're saying there's no choice but to adopt service mesh. That's, I think, from a philosophy standpoint, yeah. absolutely, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now how you actually deploy it, there could be different technologies that we're hearing about, different things, but ideal, from an ideology standpoint, I'm, I'm in. Tom, are so you in or are you out? I, well, I think resistance is not necessarily futile in this case, right? Uh, if you want to look at it from that point of view. I, I would echo the comments that some of my colleagues made with respect to different constituencies and levels of interest in adopting this technology, right? In our case, it will most likely end up being driven by risk management and security folks because uh, of the sort of concept that I mentioned to you guys when, when we did introductions, which is the sort of notion of composable enterprise. Most of the problems that this technology we think have the, has the possibility to solve are really about how we do risk management around our technology environments differently in that new world, world versus how we do it today, right? And in particular, those have to do with um, ideas such as um, you know, the perimeter, if that's even the right word anymore, being defined and managed around each individual workload as opposed to an operating system or a network segment and being able to essentially control and enforce security decisions and policies uh, regarding interactions of different workloads and users that may be invoking those workloads, uh, not just within the company's environment, but also across the public cloud, hybrid cloud, internal on-prem environments, and of course, multiple perhaps uh, cloud environments, public cloud environments as well, right? So that's sort of a key challenge is 
uh, you know, uh, how do we actually establish the ability to create a perimeter and manage the perimeter around individual snippet of code, which is really what the appropriate unit of granularity seems to be moving forward. Uh, the second problem that, that we hope this will help us with uh, really has to do with decoupling of security decisions from the underlying network fabric, the underlying operating system, and you know, dare I even say, uh, from the underlying container object, right? So it's very important for us to be able to uh, start defining security policies and attaching them um, to workloads uh, in a way that does not depend on understanding of the identity or the inner workings of all the underlying layers of abstraction, right? Whether it's the operating system, the network infrastructure, whatever the case may be. And, you know, really some of the early attempts in, in solving this problem were still very much rooted uh, in operating system level constructs like IP tables and, you know, perhaps uh, I know BPF was mentioned uh, as an implementation choice earlier today, right? So trying to get away from that as much as we can because we expect these workloads to be uh, fully unaware of the underlying infrastructure they're running on. And then the last thing, uh, you know, from a developer point of view I want to mention I think really important is uh, ability to define and manage security policy as code. Right, so we've sort of, uh, I think, uh, realizing that in order to uh, cross into the threshold of, uh, of being sort of fully composable enterprise, we have to have the ability to uh, specify, um, test, and deploy our security expectations, our security policies with the same mechanisms, not just in parallel to, but using the same mechanisms that are currently used to create, uh, integrate, deploy, and manage code. And so that's another opportunity where we feel that some of the concepts we see emerging in the service mesh space can truly um, kind of help us get closer to and, and hopefully fully address. So uh, let's focus a little bit uh, on uh, the key, and I would say this is the heart of service mesh, the Envoy proxy. Right. And we heard from Matt about why he started it and like what is the what's coming up for Envoy. So, how do you think the uh, your developers think about this new generation of load balancers that are based on on I mean, that's like really the Envoy versus like the hardware load? But how do you see this transitioning from the old stack that was dominated by a few hardware and like very prescriptive software plays into more microservices friendly Envoy proxy? And do you think this is happening in your organizations today? What is like the speed at which this happens? Well, so I think it, it happens. So for instance, in the evolution has been, you, you start in the cloud, we're a cloud company, it's cloud only, we have nothing on premise. And when you start in the cloud, you go through load balancer, you get your typical ELBs in Amazon, and that's the entry point. And at some point it does become, especially if you're, if you're not fully integrated in your development operations or your DevOps team, it becomes kind of a handoff between infrastructure and the folks that develop the code. And it becomes, uh, and this handoff actually becomes friction. Um, the, the ability to, to abstract some of this and be able to create the, the load balancing in, in, in a service mesh at, at least from our developer point of view, this is gonna make their life a lot easier and is that the first step for adoption of service mesh, getting on YN? It's one of the steps. Again, okay. you've got multiple, I think it's a win-win situation. I think you've heard from the, my, my um, fellow practitioners that there's a security benefit and no one's gonna argue about that, but there's an operational intelligence benefit and then there's an, an actual operational benefit itself. So I think there's, there's a multiple benefit, so that's one of them. And yes, I think in our case, the, being able to abstract a lot of that information, not building it into the, into the code, and not depending on like multiple, multiple teams, it's, it's a big factor for us. Um, I, I forget who said this. Someone said, you know, if it can be, be written in JavaScript, it will. Um, but more generally, if it can be done in software, it will. So I don't think it's really a question of whether or not uh, you know, you have software-defined load balancers, is it, you know, it, it's going to have to happen. Um, at my previous, we were actually consuming data from load balancers, putting them into a graph in relationship to our microservices, and then using that to, to take software-defined actions based on being able to look at dependencies, right? Um, it would be a lot easier, more real-time, if that was all in, in software. So it just, yeah, it's going to happen. Um, you know, by the way, there was one other comment on perimeter. Um, you, you'll hear this from security folks or vendors. They'll say the perimeter is gone. It, it's actually not gone. It's gotten much smaller 
and more ephemeral. Um, and that's, that's the reality. And so something like Istio um, r really um, acknowledges that reality. It acknowledges the reality of the stuff that we need to protect that has a tendency to exist. Right? I don't know what they said in physics, subatomic particles, they're, uh, they're like particles or they're waves, they have, they have a tendency to exist. This is the thing that we're dealing with. Um, so I would say this on the perimeter and the value of Istio, it, it, really, um, it, it really meshes with the actual underlying reality of, of, of things that need to protect it, they're very small units, and they have very small units of time, typically. And so, I just wanted to say, when you hear security folks say that the perimeter's gone, they are wrong, it's smaller and more ephemeral. Yeah, I mean, one thing I was gonna add also is, I mean, um, we ha I keep trying to tell myself to speak the language of the business, right? I mean, so I think, for example, and it, for developers, the concept of application load balancers is not necessarily something they've grown up with, right? I mean, I didn't grow up with it myself. So I think it's a, it's a shift in way people are thinking from being lower down in the stack, L4, L3, whatever it is now, to L7s. So I can understand that. But what I try to evangelize is what I'm after, and I think what the proxies give them, what the uh, envoys give them, for me at least, is consistency. I'm, what I'm after is consistent deployment of security. And I feel like security, certain configurations, rather than having them develop it in the code, abstracting it and making it a consistent configuration item is something they can get. Not only do they don't have to worry about it, because they've been used to probably coming, people coming at them from security and hitting them with a hammer. But if I can abstract it and say, hey, look, make this a configuration item rather than something that you have to code every time, they, they made it easier. And they get that automatic consistency is something that I hope they're able to understand. That's the reason for these envoys to do. Now, there are other things. Obviously, you can get through it. Encrypt, encryption from a security standpoint, identity and things like that, auth and auth z. Um, but those are the, some, that word consistency across all the different views. Again, some company like VMware, we had our own prem shelfware products and now we're, we're obviously trying to transform. Um, we have to walk with the business through this. Now, some, I think if you guys are cloud native companies, I think it's a lot easier, I think, the, the conversation. But for a company like VMware, it's, um, it's a journey. So it's a consistent application of security policies. Right, yeah. And, and, and a configuration layer rather than at a code layer. So I think that's a really important, actually, point to underline in that, um, to me, you know, when you think about Envoy um, or any other prior technology, those are, from a developer point of view, deployment considerations and should, for the most part, be invisible to them, right? Now, that does not mean that they should not be aware of and thinking about the type of configurations or type of security policies that need to be developed and specified when they are designing and building the code. I think that is absolutely critical, right? And as an industry, we still have an enormous amount of work to do, I think, to partner closely enough with the developers. So to them, so it becomes a sort of a natural aspect of thinking about uh, their work as they're you know, doing it on a, on, on a daily basis, right? But the notion of them worrying about whether that policy is going to be implemented using a very traditional F5 load balancer as it has been for many years or you know, perhaps even more legacy firewall technology or something much, much newer like an Envoy proxy that's sitting in a sidecar next to the container where they're running, I think for the most part should not be something that they would need to ever worry about. And I think to making that transparent, is the job of us here as end users, but also you know, a job of us as an industry when we talk about making service mesh accessible to a much broader set of end users than it is today. Okay, so final question before we open up to the audience. Um, I would say it's not a, this, this question is not an, ob, uh, it's not an obvious question, but I just wanted to, Thing, uh, put the, con the hype and the reality in context. So that's why this question comes up. So is the interest, if you, if you compare some of the big waves and developer tools of the last three, four years, right? We had Docker containers, Kubernetes, and now we have um, Envoy and Istio. How do you compare the increase in interest in Envoy and Istio compared to the prior two waves around the Kubernetes and, Do and Docker? Is this more real? Is this more faster? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, 
I, you, do we going to say more? Sorry. No, no. I, I mean, I think I, I think for me, for a security guy, again, again, we're dealing with uh, things that have a tendency to exist. We're dealing with fluid infrastructure, um, you know, hybrid environments even. And if you're going to say that I'm going to have a, a substrate that makes it easier for me to implement policy, um, that is faster. By the way, the you know what happens when you do things faster? You make more of it. It makes more risk. Um, you know, I, I was talking to someone uh, at a very, very, very large uh, bank the other day, and we were talking about the difficulty in managing um, hybrid infrastructure, on-prem and cloud. And his view was, well, you know, isn't that already all solved? I mean, now, now we're all software-defined. Isn't that all solved? And I said, no, it's never, it's never solved. When you, when you make it easier to go do things, you make it easier to go faster. It, faster does not mean more safely. It actually means you're exposing, exposing a lot more. So bottom line is this, I think something like Istio, or uh, I guess Tetrate is uh, in, in, you know, the host here, it will allow me to be able to help you go faster safely. You're still going to be exposing more risk. You're always going to be going faster. It's always going to be a problem, but it ties in faster safely. That's what I meant by yes. So, so it's interesting. It's, it's a good point. Yes, you automate and you can make a lot, mis a lot more mistakes a lot faster. So you, you cause a much bigger problem. <laughs> so I agree on that, on that front. You can totally mess things up. Um, but, the, but the idea is about the, the adoption, which is very interesting because I was just talking to a number of folks as well. I used to be on the East Coast. And it's the San Francisco bubble and then the rest of the country bubble or the world. So yes, you do get the adoption here, but the rest of the, the this is kind of the, the tip of the spear. It's like you kind of right there. So yes, the adoption is faster, but even in our environment where the adoption is faster, we've adopted everything. So as a five-year-old company, we've, we didn't spare too many things. Now, many of them eventually didn't find as much use and now they're a technology debt. So the question is how, the, how can we make sure that this doesn't become another piece of technology debt? And I think, from, as I said, from a, from a security perspective, the ability to extend it, not just to microservices, but to the entire technology stack, it's, it's very important. So I can have a single set of controls. I don't have to have too many. The technology solutions that live on top of it are going to make it or break it. Because if you don't have a good interface to set up all your policies and so forth, sure, you can do things with it. But it's, going to be, uh, it's not going to be as easy to manage. So I think that's, that's what's going to drive, hopefully, the adoption. The new products are coming on top of it. And they've been around, and there's, as I said, there's a lot of them sprouting. I'm having a hard time finding them because hmm. I'm interested. But that's my two cents. So to, to kind of uh, underscore that, but, but I think a slightly different perspective on speed, right? Um, I think the adoption is going to be slower, but the impact of it, I think, is going to be significantly uh, more meaningful and more effective, at least from security and risk management point of view. And that, I think, has to do with the ability to deploy this in brownfield type scenarios, right? So when you look at you know, Kubernetes and Docker, uh, with the exception of certain geographies or certain industries, as it was already mentioned, um, you know, and perhaps enterprises in a certain life cycle of their existence, uh, those are uh, very focused technology developments that don't need to be or cannot even actually be adopted in a, you know, fully in a brownfield type IT environment, right? This solution, I think, has the potential to be adopted in a brownfield environment, and that's why it will have a significantly larger impact on our enterprises if we do it right. But that also comes with a lot of baggage that we need to solve for, and I think that uh, you know, one of the things that is important in making sure that this does get adopted and embraced by large enterprises is positioning it properly with all the different constituencies that can benefit from it, right? So we have a significant sales job ahead uh, you know, on all of our parts to convince our enterprises that this is the right way to think about how to implement security in the company, not just for that 5% or 10% of the environment that is dockerized or that's managed by Kubernetes, but perhaps for the 70% and 80% of the environment that includes a lot of legacy workloads, a lot of legacy operating systems, non-cloud-based deployments, and so on. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, from my, I'll just give a data point from my completely uninteresting career, <laughs> which is I've never been on a panel talking about Docker. I was never on a panel talking about containers. <laughs> so, I mean, I, but, but I'm in security, right? I, and obviously, these are huge waves. But there's a reason why I'm passionate about service mesh and Istio and things like that, because there's a real security advantage to it. Um, and obviously, Docker's good reasons for it, but the developers were doing it themselves. And I was scrambling after them saying, how do I secure this? Same with containers. I was running after them saying, guys, slow down. I don't know how I'm going to secure these environments. With service mesh, it's different. 
because I see clear advantages to it. So I'm almost being an advocate to it. So I think for those who are not in the security space, there's a great advantage for you to engage your security professionals and say, guys, you need to come along with me because you can be part of the buying process. And I mean, when security champions things, definitely if compliance comes on board with it too, there's a lot much, it's a, it's a lot easier to get that funding, right? So. Yeah, that's a good point. So thank you. So I'm going to open the floor to audience questions. So we'll have like another five minutes or so. Please, uh, please go ahead. Who's going, to, who's going to go first? Yes, please. Sorry, uh, can I ask you to tell your name and where you're from? Sure. Uh, Hurricane, I work for Gap. So we're early on in the journey here. Uh, we're in the process of adopting it. They had that three-step thing earlier. Yep. Our driver from day one is step three, which are the security benefits. Monitoring, telemetry, that's all my security is my big one. Um, one thing that we're finding to be interesting, right, so architecturally, the fact that you assemble these concerns out of code, distinction of your developers that just want to build business value, right? So architecturally fully agree, but what we're finding to be interesting, and I'm curious about your take on, is DevOps has brought concerns that used to be some centralized group's concern, be that security, be that networking, closer to the teams building those services. So on the one hand, architecturally, this separates the concerns in a nicely decoupled way. What we're finding is it's almost taking some of what DevOps has brought back to the team and saying, who's going to manage all the configuration of Kubernetes, of Istio? Does some of that back out to a central group? And I'm curious to see how you guys are seeing that pendulum swinging back and forth. Thank you. <clears throat> so as I said, we have, we we're planning to, to, uh, to move to Service Mesh sometime in, I want to say, late Q2. So we haven't got to that point yet. But I think that the, uh, it brought up an interesting collaboration because now we're actually working, we're moving more toward this sec DevOps kind of aspect. We're, we're, we're involved, we're all working together. Um, we're trying to define, again, who does what and for what purpose. So our, our goal is to define, uh, not necessarily to be the operational aspect, but we're going to define some broader rules that hopefully can be followed by uh, the folks that will do it, and those will be the DevOps. Uh, team. So I don't know if that answered your question, but our goal ultimately would be, look, from a governance perspective, we can tell you certain things um, and, and be involved in, in an advisory uh, role and keep an eye on things, but we're essentially creating sort of the acceptable, um, uh, the acceptable way to use the platform and allowing them to operate it. So that's, and keeping an eye on it, if something doesn't match whatever we said this is, should be this way, then that's where the data comes in, that's a visibility that comes in, and then we see, well, this wasn't done, uh, this wasn't done well. But uh, haven't been, haven't figured it out yet completely, we're about to do it. Yeah, I mean, Patrick, I think well said. I think that's exactly some of the challenges that we're facing with it, it's a little bit, but I think I, I look at it as a very positive thing, because we're moving the step in the right direction, we are giving, we're enhancing the value proposition of security by saying we're taking things away from you, which is good because it's a pain they don't want to deal with because we come in later on and say you're not compliant, this and that. So in a way, we're enabling those things. And the way I look at it is I now just have to find a different reason to come and talk to you, but hopefully it's a more pleasant conversation to talk about innovation and other things like that rather than the past having to come with some report saying it's all red. So I've looked at it as, yes, I can get out of your hair for all the things that were used to be negative. I can take that away from you, but it's almost the platform of a good relationship building to say, now let's do something more innovative on how I can enable you more. I think the definition of bureaucracy is the, you're more bureaucratic where decisions are removed from execution, right? That, so the more Kevin Bacons you have from that, the more bureaucratic you are. And I think what you were saying was, does this create a mu uh, potential movement to more bureaucracy? Is, is that what I assume you said, the separation? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I would say this, success or winning is when you can put more power safely within the hands of people to get things done, this is winning. Um, and I would, if I were to see security um, creating bureaucracy, like where everyone's always waiting on us, that's not winning, right? Um, so everything that we do increasingly is security should be software defined and should really work right in uh, with that process. I don't know if that helped or not. Thank you. Cool. Um, we have time for one last question. Who wants to go next? Yes, Randy. Give me one sec, I'll get the mic. So, so you, <laughs> surprise. Yeah, and for um, everybody's benefit, where you're from, your name? Uh, Randy Bias. I currently work at Juniper Networks, um, but I have a long history. Most people can figure that out. Um, so you were talking about uh, the need for service meshes around brownfield apps. But earlier, we had a panel of people who were actually deploying service meshes in production, and they said, hey, man, these things are complex. They're like hard to run, hard to understand. Uh, don't use one unless you need one. Well. I look at brownfield legacy applications, anything from mainframes to you know, kind of our virtualized silos in VMware land, there's a lot of complexity there. I mean, it doesn't really feel like adding a service mesh is gonna remove complexity. It feels like it's gonna add it, number one. Number two, um, I haven't seen those teams really willing to embrace new. So I, I don't see how you're gonna explain a service mesh when they know they can just buy another Palo Alto Networks firewall, whoops, or a Juniper SRX. Don't get in trouble. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, they're going to buy some kind of box, and they're very comfortable with buying a box. And if you're comfortable with buying a box to solve your problem and throw it in the data center, you just keep doing that, right? Because you, you know, your job's not risk. Implementing like service meshes between your brownfield apps or your brownfield and your greenfield apps seems like high complexity, high risk, very low value. And I get why people want to build businesses around the brownfield legacy stuff. But you know all the velocity is elsewhere, so I'd just like to hear you make a really compelling case for the brownfield legacy apps because I, I just I can't connect it. Well, so, so part of it is that you know we may not necessarily have a lot of choice, right? And that the brownfield apps, uh, uh, you know, where in the past we've I think seen and expected them to operate in isolated environments, you know, perhaps with whatever integrations exist in There's the There's no such thing as an isolated environment. Well, I think 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? Um, certainly not, not the case anymore. But my point is that I think that we talked about, a couple of us mentioned the notion of shrinking perimeter, right? I think that perimeter has shrunken not just around new deployment models like containerization, but it's also shrinking rapidly around the legacy apps in that a lot of the newer development that we're doing newer apps that we're rolling are expecting to interact with all the legacy applications because in many cases they still run core lines of business or core functions for the business, right? And so the kind of architecture where you still keep your legacy apps isolated in some environment and apart from the newer development efforts is really not, really not viable anymore, right? And I think that's what's driving, from a brownfield adoption point of view, the interest in seeing whether we can instrument some of these legacy environments. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to you know, rip apart every app and containerize every app with a sidecar Envoy. That's probably not going to happen, right? But we may, in fact, either deploy uh, Envoys on individual instances of the operating systems of those brownfield apps, or if that is not possible because of legacy OSs, whatever the case may be, then at least create very tightly managed API gateway type perimeters that are specific to an application or a set of components of that application, right? That's yeah, but, required. I mean, so I get what you're saying, and okay, there hasn't been a perimeter for a very long time. I don't even, we should just remove that word from the lexicon because it's disappeared, you know, 20 years ago. By my counting, but it's all good. Not in, in some industries, it's still around. You know, my, there's my, not a perimeter. There's a pretend per perimeter. We pretend there's a perimeter, but there's not a perimeter. It's like That's a my pretend opinion. prophylactics. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I would actually argue that you know, perimeters is a uh, challenging word. This is important, though. I think you know, the reality is, is trust is somewhat of a continuum, right? Um, where we have environments where you expect you can come into this room, 
some of you can come in this room, but you have to play nice. That means we trust you, we've authorized you with a certain amount of trust, right? And what we're, when I talk about perimeter, what I'm just saying is this idea of what we call a trusted zone where people are allowed to play nice is smaller. The reality is we have chaotic actors, they're intelligent adversaries, and they do things that we don't expect. They'll always be around, and they've been around Let, since. Let's go with that term, trust zone, I like it. Yeah. All right, so what we've got in the, in, the, in the enterprise right now is a whole bunch of hub and spoke trust zones inside the hub, right? We put a firewall around it, right? And inside the hub, it's, that's a trust zone. For, for right now, just give it to me, right? So I, so I get that that is broken, but I also get that everybody loves it and is very comfortable with it, right? They don't really want to move away from it. And then you're talking about an API gateway model that just recreates the hub and spoke model. If, if we really wanted security be, to be fixed from what it is right now, then we would be taking an approach that was highly distributed, dynamic, security-based products that would actually move and you know, kind of ebb and flow with the environments. Recreating hub and spoke in software instead of in hardware using Envoy proxy you know, for mainframes or legacy brownfield apps, I don't see how that does anything except move you from a hardware-based model to a software-based model. It's like virtualizing a box. You still have a box. It's just a virtual box. Well, I think, so I think the, 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 here's how we, I would define the perimeter. Identi and they say that identity is a new perimeter. So every identity is a perimeter. You, uh, I'm not going to trust the whole table, but you are a separate in, uh, entity at the table. So that's a perimeter. You are the perimeter. And the way you interact with others needs to be managed in some ways. Yes, you can put them all at the same table and say everyone at the same table is got the same level of trust. But maybe I want to say, even if I'm at the same table, I don't want to trust everyone else at the table. So I think what, and this is my two cents. In our world, yes, we're going to start service mesh in the micro instances environment. And we want to bring solutions that will help us extend it. We have a monolith. So we still have legacy, who you call the brownfield. We, we have the, we eventually need to get there because our remote access and everything will be based on zero trust. No one will trust anyone. If you need to get access to someone, it will be created on demand, the access to a particular application, for instance, for users coming remotely. Applications will talk to applications, again, based on identity and a set of policies. And we want to do that across the board. It doesn't make sense just to do it in the microservices and then have something totally different in another environment. So I think you will see that identity will be the perimeter. It will eventually bleed into the brownfield. It will take time. But if you start in the microservices, you, you have a better chance to get there. And it doesn't have to be hub and spoke. Okay. So, so that, that's the thing. So uh, I would love to extend this to three hours. But in the next <laughs> service match day, we're going to do it like over three hours. And, uh, and I'm going to request Randy to be the moderator in the next service match day for the CISO <laughs> panel. Because uh, I don't think I can be as controversial as you. But it is, uh, firstly, thank you all for making time. I know hundreds of vendors chase you and hundreds of and, you know, millions of threats also chase you. So. Um, it's, uh, it's really, really heartwarming to see that the CISO organizations is, are leaning in towards service mesh and not, uh, okay, I'm, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to say the other words, but yeah, you're leaning in, so thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I hope in the next RSA Innovation Sandbox, there may be a few service mesh startups in the finalists. Uh, so, Rich? By the way, a little hint for those of you who are involved and in, in think you might want to participate in uh, either the RSA Sandbox or other ones, it's always good to meet with people who are like, like, I don't know, like judges of that and show them your stuff. It really helps. Yeah. I'm, I'm a judge. <laughs> <laughs> Point noted. I mean, RSA Innovation Sandbox has determined some really uh, big security winners before. So. so thank you, everybody. And so we, uh, we went way over time. So we are going to go straight into the next uh, uh, session, 1.30 session. And uh, we will uh, get going on that one. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Louis Ryan, the key creator of Vistio at Google. <laughs>